Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler. After a day's rest for the players to recharge in the 2017 Norway chess, round four is as good as underway with some interesting games. Levon Aronia meets his arch enemy Magnus Carlsen. The leader Nakamura is up against the very strong Vahila Graf. Kramnik is looking to get through Karwana. Wesley So faces Kayakin and Anishgiri with white is up against Vichy Anand. The game I would like to cover has to be the one between the world champion Carlsen and Aronian. Last year during this time, in the same tournament, it was Levon who won and when Levon was able to pin Carlsen's bishop. The two have played each other over 90 times with Carlsen having won twice as many games. But many variables have changed ever since the two first met in 2004. And at this level of play, it doesn't really matter who's white because looking at this statistically, don't be surprised to hear black in the last 25 games won more times than white. With these observations in mind, let's tap into the game. Aronian with white started up with d4 and with a response like d5, we just knew this game was going to go into the queen's gambit. Having seen c4 and c6, the Slav, Aronian moved on with knight f3, knight f6, knight c3 and now e6, one of the most normal developments in this type of opening, the semi-Slav. With e3 and a6, Carlsen brought the game into the semi-Slav accelerated Meran variation, which is exactly the same as the Alekheim variation. So do not get confused if you see this come up under the Queen's Gambit declined Alekheim variation. The c6 and e6 pawns are very solid for black, but one drawback of this structure is that black only has one minor piece developed against two of whites. b3 invited the bishop to come into b4 and through bishop d2, knight d7 and bishop d3, both players castled in turn and with queen e7 and bishop back to c2, there are plenty of hidden moves and initiatives, particularly from white. But given Carlsen is the opposition here, we expect very little to be able to get past right through him. Rook d8 afforded Aronian the opportunity to attack the bishop, but once Carlsen looked at the situation, he simply grabbed the pawn on a3, and here we see Aronian come up with the move of the game, and any takers here in 2, 1 and pause. Rook takes a3, giving up his rook for a pawn and a bishop, so what is the tremendous sacrifice on a3 all about? Nothing seems to make sense until you see Aronian's next move. Aronian came up with an excellent resource and by advancing his pawn to c5, just look at the state of Carlsen's queen. Though she's not lost, she's nevertheless trapped and her scope is now very limited. b6 was an attempt to open up the position but Aronian found b4 and the fireworks had already started. Taking on b4 spells disaster because the knight can easily take on d5 and with the queen being exposed to the discovery after c4 and now knight e7, king f8 will bring about bishop b3 and with the queen finding d3, the knight can remove another pawn and black is in trouble. In light of this, Carlsen did not take on b4, but centralised his knight. But when the knights came off, the bishop grabbed another pawn, and I'm sure there was a better move for Carlsen to play. He got his rook on b8. And once again, I'm going to ask you to find what Aronian came up with in 2, 1, and pause. Bishop takes h7 with a check ripping open the king's side because after the king recaptured, the knight came in with a fresh check and now with king g8, Aronian found queen h5. 
And if we just stop here for a sec, just look at how inactive Carlson's Queen is right now. But just forget Carlson's Queen for now and let us concentrate on where the action is. White has a large threat, not only here on h7, but also on f7. Carlson's knight moved to f6, allowed the queen to remove this pawn with a check, and now the king was reduced to only h8. Queen c7 was a top move because bishop d7 ties the rooks together, but does nothing to stop the check on f7. And with king h7, knight takes and now rook c8, the queen removed another pawn, and now Carlson found the chance to attack the queen through knight d5. Queen h7 dropped the knight on d8, but with a direct attack on the knight with e4, though the knight could easily have found f6, Carlson had another idea and wedged this queen into d3. With the additional removal of two pieces, the queen came in on c7, attacking both the rook and the bishop, but Carlson through queen g5 saves every single threatened piece. Taking on c6, push the bishop to c8, and with h3, queen d5, and rook d1, we could not have asked for a better game. Carlson had an easy rook f8 before he's able to free up the queen, but instead went for e5. And what does this move do if the rook finds d3? Taking on d4 led to queen e7, and with bishop f5, Aronian found rook g3, and Carlson just knew it was game over. Because after the bishop retreated to g6, Aronian only needed to find the very easy queen check on h4, and after having found it, and knowing the bishop was coming off, Carlson handed over his resignation. A spectacular game in every single sense, with an explosive start from Aronian, having given up his rook and then his bishop, and this is what chess is at his very best. And on this note, Many thanks for taking part and many, many thanks for watching. Many more games to follow shortly.